Good evening, Visions Dinner guests. I'm Jennifer Yu, and I'll be serving as your MC this evening. Before we begin our main program, I do want to go over some executive with us tonight. He's <laughs> Lily Chi, Director of Special Projects at the Office of the Montgomery County Executive. Thank you. We also have Ms. Lori Edberg, Special Assistant to the U.S. Senator of Maryland, Barbara Lovansky. We also started in 2017. We do have Delia Mark here out in the front. And for the town of Herndon, Council Member Grace Hanwell, thank you so much for coming. Maryland State Delegate David Moon, who is also the first time for an American State Legislature. With that, let's begin with Mr. Alan Kittleman. Uh, welcome to Howard County. Uh, uh, I am the new county executive elected back in November. Uh, prior to that, I served 10 years in the Maryland State Senate and six years on the Howard County Council. So I'm not new uh, to politics, but I'm new to this position. Uh, the Howard County Executive is basically the mayor or the governor of Howard County, the executive branch. So we basically make sure that all the laws are implemented and, and all the administration things are done to make sure the snow is removed so we can have this event tonight. Um, so hopefully, uh, if you live in Howard County, we're doing a good job so far, but if you have any concerns, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I, uh, my background, I have a strong background in civil rights. My father actually was very involved in the civil rights movement in Howard County uh, back in the 1950s and 60s to help desegregate the Howard County Public Schools, which we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of this year. Um, and so I kind of got that as a role model, and I continue to work on that as well. Uh, David Lee is here. I don't know, David, can you raise your hand? He's back there from my office. Hey. Hey, David. Uh, David worked for the prior county executive, and what I've learned as I became county executive is don't fix something that's not broken, and make sure you keep the folks who are doing a great job, and David's doing a great job for us, so I wanted to make sure he could stay on, and he's doing a fantastic job, and he's a part of the outreach we have to the community. And so with regard to the community, the Korean American community, I certainly have met with uh, uh, Larry Chang, who I think is here, and Peter Wang from the Korean Society of Maryland. Um, also with the Howard County Korean Association, and now with the Women's Association, the Women's Society. Uh, I look forward to continuing that out outreach. We've worked with Korean businesses uh, to open up a new uh, H Mart up here in Howard County to make sure that worked out, and also with some others. So uh, I, my goal is to make sure that, that the Korean community comes out and has more uh, opportunities as best we can. So I'll continue to work on that, and I think my two minutes are definitely up. So <laughs> I will let somebody else now answer any questions. Thank you very much again. Welcome to Howard County. Thank you, Mr. Kinoma. Now we will have Ms. Lori Edburn from Senator Marva Mikulski's office. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to say the Senator is very sorry she could not make it tonight. As you are probably aware, this has been a huge week for the Senator with her announcement on Monday. But um, I am very honored to be here in her place. She did write a letter. I will not read all of it, just a portion of it in honor of this evening. Um, women's history is American history. Women have been trailblazers throughout our history using grit, passion, and determination to seize the day and make a difference. The rich history of American women include Harriet Tubman, Sally Ride, Lily Ledbetter, Rosa Parks, Helen Keller, Amelia Earhart, the suffragist, and Rosie the Riveter. I could go on, but instead I will say that we not, must not only honor the past and these amazing women before us, but we also must learn from it. Today, more families depend on women as their primary breadwinner than ever before. Women make up two-thirds of minimum wage workers. We need to raise their wages and make sure they're not sidelined by paycheck discrimination or outdated policies. Thank you. <laughs> the Equal Pay Act was passed in June 1963 when women earned merely 59 cents to every dollar earned by men. And here we are more than 50 years later at 77 cents, still trying to close the loopholes. Now we need to finish what we started to prevent discrimination from happening in the first place. So the battle is still enjoined. This is not about the past. And it's not only about the present, but it's also about the future. Thank you for all you do every day to keep the dream of America alive for all our daughters. Thank you so much. And now if we can have Ms. Lechi, that would be wonderful. 
Let's give her a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. And I would like to use up all of the times they didn't use tonight. <laughs> Good evening. I was really flattered when I was uh, getting my uh, um, finger food. A lady approached me and started speaking Korean. And I, I had to apologize, even though I, I was very flattered that I look Korean, but you know. <laughs> um, I'm here in dual roles tonight. First of all, I'm chairman of uh, chairwoman of Governor's Commission on Asian American Affairs, and I see Steve uh, McAdams who came to my office and we talked about a range of community issues. And in my previous life, I was Montgomery County Executive's liaison for Asian American communities. So I had extensive relationship with the Korean community, and I felt very um, honored to have that experience. Um, in my second hat today, I'm also uh, representing our County Executive Ike Leggett. Uh, who has been a great friend of uh, Korean American community. And in Montgomery County, even though I have to give credit to Howard County, which has the highest concentration of Korean Americans in the state of New York, but there's a friendly competition there between Montgomery and Howard on uh, everything, right? We still have, in absolute numbers, the largest Korean American community in Montgomery County, so we're proud of that. Montgomery County has a very proud tradition of supporting Korean Americans and Korean American CBOs, what we call CBOs, community-based organizations that work on domestic violence assistance, work on senior services, work on family resettlement, integration, finding jobs, learning English, and the county appropriates funding to support these organizations because you do what government cannot do, which is linguistic cultural competency um, and, and deliver services through that kind of competency to extend the reach. So we very much appreciate what you do. And personally, you know, as a Chinese immigrant woman, I feel a lot of connection with uh, anyone who came here as an adult, had to learn English and had to struggle. I wish 20 some years ago when I came here, fresh off the boat, so to speak, that there was an organization like a Korean woman um, organization or, or any organization for Asian American women to help with my personal uh, struggles and, and cultural integration. So today I try to pay back in whatever I know how to do, you know, I write a column, I talk about these issues, so I want to just thank you for being such a great advocate, and personally, I hope, here's a word for all the ladies here, um, as an Asian woman, uh, I hope you personally would charge forward to keep fighting for your place in this world. Don't let anyone uh, value you less than who you really are and, and for what you do. Thank you. Good evening everyone, it's great to see all of you and uh, thank you so much to my friends from Maryland for inviting me from across the river on the other side of the Potomac to come join you here. My name is Mark He and I serve in the General Assembly of Virginia and unlike your friends uh, in Maryland, uh, Annapolis, we're done. Richmond, we're, we're there as of last week, so we went uh, during the Senate DA, and we'll be going back to the veto session in April, so now I'm back in my day job. But let me uh, tell you a couple of reasons why I'm here. Even though I'm from Virginia, I have something in common with your new governor, Larry Hogan. Because Governor Hogan and I both married Korean women from Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is a... Uh, uh, Salisbury uh, uh, native. She came to the U.S. when she was about six years old. Her family settled in Salisbury where her parents worked on the chicken farm. And years later they ended up moving to Towson. My wife graduated from Towson State and then she went to uh, University of Maryland for her grad school and then moved down to Virginia where we ended up marrying. And so even though she's a Virginian now, she's deep inside, she's a, uh, she's a Marylander as well. So glad to be back home here. Uh, I also wanted to thank all of you for inviting us and celebrating today. Obviously, uh, the Korean American Women's Society of Maryland is uh, having a fresh start, and I look forward to working with all of you to create this organization to a robust, strong network that will help create a base for Korean American women and all women in Maryland come together and work together on issues that are important. But let's remember, today is uh, March. March is, of course, National Women's History Month. But today, March 7th, is a particularly important day. Fifty years ago today, as many of you know, in Selma, about 600 African Americans crossed a bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which is named after a Civil War Confederate general. And as they came to the other side of that bridge, they were met by a sea of blue men in uniform who beat them over the head with a stick. 
Because what they were trying to do, the African American who crossed that bridge, what they were trying to do was stand up for their own rights. Stand up for nothing more, nothing less than what the Constitution promised them, which is equal rights and, ju and justice for all. And yet, 50 years ago today, they were met with violence. Now, at that time, there weren't a lot of people that looked like us on that bridge. There were not many Asian Americans as part of the 50s and 60s civil rights movement. The 1965 Voting Rights Act followed as a result of that, but so did the 1965 Immigration Law. And I know you'll be hearing from Julia Choi pretty soon about what it means to be a, a working on immigration reform today. But the 1965 Immigration and Nationalization Reform Act which is how most of our families came to the United States as a result of them opening up immigration from Asia, that law was a direct result of the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s. And so even though people that looked like me and, and Mary and, and many others in this room, we Asian Americans were not as present in the 50s and the 60s, we are the beneficiaries of that movement. What that means is we now have the responsibility to carry on that civil rights and movement for justice and equality throughout the country. And that starts right here in Maryland, the free state. It starts right here in Maryland and Virginia, where we have Korean Americans like uh, myself and David and Mark Chang, who serve in the General Assembly. We have Korean Americans like Grace Hong Wolf serving at the town council levels. We have Korean and Asian Americans all throughout the governor. And in fact, we have a first lady in the governor's office. So we want to make sure that we as Asian Americans today are full, equal partners in the promise of the 21st century. So that's why I think we're here today, and I'm glad to be here. I want, I want to thank my friends for inviting me again, and I look forward to working with you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll talk to the council member from Herndon, Grace Han Wolf. My name is Grace Han Wolf, and uh, as Mark mentioned, I am elected to the Herndon Town Council in the town of Herndon. I am the first Korean American woman ever elected to the Commonwealth, so for Maryland, you guys need to catch up. <laughs> Great to see one of you running the next couple of years. Um, what I'm really here to talk about is in 1903, the first Koreans that landed on the shores of Honolulu. We earned the right to vote in 1952 when we earned the right to become citizens. And in the 60 years since 1952, it has taken, I got elected in 2010, that's a long time, people, 1952 to 2010 to have the first Korean American woman elected. Mark was elected in 2008? Nine. Nine. So again, 1952 to 2009, it's a long time for us to come. So in the next 50 years, I hope you will speed it up, young people. We have a wonderful community. We need to realize our place and to take our seat at the table. All the work, we need to build the work that was done by the first folks that came over, by the first folks who enabled the civil rights movement. You know, today is the 50th anniversary of that Selma March. I think today is a really good day to think about where do we want to be in the next 50 years. And so I hope and encourage all of you to seek out your full American dream with your Korean American heritage. Thank you. We do have Mark Chang, who just arrived. Hey, Mark. Yeah. 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 Good evening, everybody. It's great to see this great turnout here today. Uh, congratulations to all the organizer, uh, Mary Ann Brackney and myself. I know we've known each other about a decade or so. We've worked in the community, uh, just helping folks out on a daily basis. And just looking around the room, it's good to see all the different folks that I've had the honor to be able to work with it throughout the years, just uh, you know, in the community. And the Secretary, former Secretary, Veteran Secretary, it's good to see you, sir. But it's also great to see the diversity, uh, you know, with uh, Ms. Wolf and also with uh, Delegate Kim here, and to see the uh, the joint effort of, you know, not just in Maryland, but, you know, tri-state or bi-state and, and just regionally. So uh, thank you for all the work that you all are doing, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great honor to be here. A lot of my roots are from the background, just being able to work with uh, folks like yourself on a daily basis and you know it's a thankless job. It's a thankless job to get out every day and just volunteer or help folks out on a daily basis. So you know sometimes there you know you don't see the rewards up front very uh, quickly but you know eventually you know the re rewards come out of it and it's a great honor to uh, represent uh, this community in the entire state of Maryland as one of 141 delegates in the state of the Maryland House of Delegates along with uh, David Moon. So it's a it's a tremendous honor. We look forward to serving you. Come on, sweet eye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to serve with uh, Mark Chang. We're the two new uh, 
Korean American delegates, first time in the General Assembly, 2014, so I think we're behind Virginia, unfortunately. Um, yeah, not for long, so you know, hopefully that's on the better thing. But we did get two at the same time. This is my first uh, legislative session. Unlike Virginia, we're still going. We're about halfway through. Uh, but I have to say, it is a tremendous honor to represent our community's perspective in the Assembly. I wasn't quite sure when I got there um, just uh, how often my parents' values and their upbringing and uh, you know, my, my experience as a second generation immigrant would come into play. Uh, but just this week, I started working with uh, Senator Susan Lee, who's Chinese, on uh, human sex trafficking uh, legislation to curb this problem. And you know, for those of you that are paying attention, I think that uh, Asians are very disproportionately affected by this problem. And so uh, we're making strides on that. It's a bipartisan effort. Um, the governor and uh, a number of Republican delegates and senators are involved in this effort. So I hope we're going to be able to tackle that. Um, but going back to my parents, you know, both of them are small business owners. And so one of the things that I wanted to tackle in the assembly was to change this paradigm where most of the economic development dollars that are spent uh, at the state and the federal level are going to very large companies when, in fact, most of the immigrant-based uh, populations, and Korean Americans in particular, uh, are employed or are owners of small businesses. And so, uh, again, I've got some bipartisan support for an initiative on this, and I hope uh, over the summer uh, I'll be able to announce something with uh, Republican Delegate Chris West from uh, Baltimore County um, so we're going to start working on sh uh, shifting this paradigm to get small business there, and it'll be imperative to get Korean Americans at the table uh, once we uh, start unlocking some of these dollars. Uh, and the last thing I'll leave you with, um, and this is where I'm going to take my bipartisanship off for a second, um, you know, we are facing pretty uh, brutal budget cuts in Maryland. Uh, they're hitting the public school system, uh, and that's been getting a lot of attention. What's not been getting as much attention is the uh, college cuts that are coming down. And so, you know, the Asian American community, my parents in particular, were uh, pressing upon me all the time the importance of higher education. Um, not just a college degree, that wasn't enough. I had to go and get a law degree also. Um, so I did that. But now we're in a situation where, uh, you know, I believe that due to the budget cuts that uh, have hit our higher education institutions, uh, we might see tuition. Uh, increasing on people, and as we know, the Asian American community in Maryland and in the United States is not a monolith. You know, we have uh, poor, rich, uh, middle class all over the spectrum, so I think it's imperative for us to, uh, to take care of the next generation in the same way that our parents and our uh, grandparents laid the groundwork for our ability to uh, thrive in this country using education as a stepping stone. So um, those are just some of the things I hope to work on put the bipartisan hat back on, um, and I'm uh, thankful to be here, and thanks uh, uh, to uh, County Executive uh, Kilman for uh, his surprise win, so uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And we do have Ms. Christine Toyon Harley, Senior Policy Advisor from White House Initiative on Hi, I wasn't expecting to speak, but I wanted to thank um, Mary Ann for having our White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders represented here. And um, I just, to say a little bit about our office, uh, this is an office that was reestablished by President Obama um, through executive order with the goal of increasing access and participation for uh, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders in federal programs and, um, and, and, and resources that are available. And so, I think that this um, evening is actually uh, very important because uh, my family also um, came over actually in 1970s, right after the 1965 um, bill was passed and um, have, have been in Maryland um, that entire time. And so I didn't know about this organization um, prior to this event, but I think knowing that there have been strong Korean American women who have been fighting for so long to make sure that we have voices and representation um, is, is so important. Um, another thing to just say about my uh, office, we work on um, a cross-cutting range of issues that are important to all Asian Americans, language access, uh, capacity building for um, small businesses or uh, uh, community-based organizations, 
We work on issues of immigration, healthcare access, um, uh, business development. And so, you know, I think that uh, I'm happy to, to meet all of you, um, to be a resource for you all. Um, and we want to make sure that um, through the end of this administration that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that Korean Americans and other Asian American um, communities are well represented within the federal government and, and throughout the government. We think that um, having uh, people that look like us, that understand our issues and are trying to um, advance the uh, community's rights um, need to be placed um, throughout the federal government. And so. Thank you very much, um, and have a great evening. Um, until I actually learned how to speak English perfectly, um, and that's also how I got my name, Priscilla. Uh, my Korean name is Min Gyeong. So um, I grew up in a most predominantly African-American neighborhood. Um, I would say 98, 99% of my school was African-American. And I think growing up, my identity was always identified by who I was not rather than who I was. Um, and it wasn't really until college where I found community, where I could articulate in a productive way what it meant to be Korean-American. Um, through words instead of tears, um, through love and not anger, through songs and not shouting. Um, and I realized that we as a community share a lot of common experiences. The common experience as uh, second generation children um, of immigrants who stand on the shoulders of the millions of sacrifices made by our parents. The common experience of working at our parents' small business, uh, whether that's a beauty supply store like my parents, or dry cleaners, or grocery stores, or liquor stores. Um, and I remember growing up, I was always worried about their safety um, and having my heart churn whenever we would hear about fellow Korean American or just any small business owner that had um, experienced violence or um, had been attacked in their stores. The common experience of going back to my parents' store every time I go on vacation to Tennessee and uh, you know, selling wigs and hair products and pretending like I know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and my one wish being that my parents would retire um, as soon as possible so they could still you know, enjoy their life while they're still happy, uh, while they're still healthy. Um, the common experience of reconciling our parents' expectations and wishes for us and trying to chart our individual paths. And the common experience with pride, um, I think the key that holds our community together, uh, but also what holds us back a lot of times from moving forward and reaching out for help. Uh, we have all these experiences that define um, who we are and create challenges as we think about the future, but also um, a way to really bring us together. Um, I think in this upcoming panel, we're gonna talk about tangible ways to really form this um, community for Korean American women. But I wanna talk about something that's really personal to me um, that I, I feel like affect many women and particularly Korean American women. And it's something called effortless perfection. Uh, it's a coined term by my alma mater, Duke. I know a lot of Maryland Turkish <laughs> don't like Duke, but um, uh, I was able to uh, use this uh, term, so I'm, I'm thankful for my education there. Um, but it's basically the a concept where, um, you know, as a woman, you get a good education, you're supposed to get a perfect job, get married to the perfect husband, have a perfect family and all of this is possible um, effortlessly. And I think as Korean American women, um, especially those of us who are very ambitious and career driven and have big dreams for ourselves um, and our families, our, our parents, our grandparents, and as well as our future children, um, all these pressures really do play into our daily lives. Uh, my mother, who I love very much, is terrified that I'm 30 and still not married. Um, she's equally or even more terrified and annoyed that I don't know how to cook Korean food, um, which to her she always tells me is essential in her mind to please my future husband and family. Um, and I remember 
course, she wouldn't talk to me for a whole week when I toyed with the idea of not having children. Um, but you know, it, and, and, and I know that uh, all of us have experienced the pressures of, of Korean mothers, our strong Korean mothers. But I see in my community of even very ambitious and successful women, my best friend just quit her job when um, she had a kid so that she could spend um, her time seeing her baby grow up. And I realize even those smart, capable women, um, we can't have it all. And maybe we can, but uh, it takes a community and it takes a village. Um, and as we think about the future, um, as, as particularly a Korean American community of women, let's just be real with each other um, and understand that there is really no effortless perfection or even perfection. And that life is actually ridden with rejection, with suffering, humiliation. Um, but instead of responding with shame, which we frequently do, we can pick up as a community and share our stories with each other and lift each other up and not pull the ladder up from someone, but help them up the ladder. We can take our hurtful experiences and turn them into an empowering story of survival, vulnerability, and achievements. And I think of the future, um, and I dream that we can have as a community, not, some, not only a community that we can give um, and share economic capital, social capital, and political capital, but one where we can share imaginative capital, which I think is the ability to imagine ourselves um, individually and as a community in a different place, in a better place than where we are right now. So that the next generation of leaders can aspire to amazing things that not only highlight their own achievements, um, but also the sacrifices and the efforts of the community as a whole. Um, I also dream that we would be not be scared to reach out to each other, um, to be bold not only in our pursuits, but also in our service, um, that we would be the example of a community that is great not because of where we started and the number of high-income jobs that we might have, but because of our ability to support each other through our failures and to grow together. And I think it starts here, friends, um, at this vision dinner, and uh, where we can bridge gaps and break barriers like the theme is. And I look forward to seeing all of you in this effort to um, move forward and, and br really bridging the gaps um, in the future. Thank you. So for the final part of our program, we would like to have an interactive session with Ms. Choi, Ms. Juliet Choi, and Associate Judge Jeannie Choi, Jeannie Cho, excuse me, as panelists, as well as Priscilla. Many of us grew up in the United States. What was your childhood as a Korean American like? Our own inability to communicate as well as we wished we could with our own parents, but also with other people, and we saw how difficult it was for our parents to have to ask me when I was 10 years old to communicate and fight with somebody about collecting money. So I got very good at that. <laughs> I was a real collector, but yes, it's, it's a unique experience that I think all the immigrants, um, everyone who is here brand new, their children are in a unique position to be caught in two different worlds, and I hope that that experience benefits us, and, and it doesn't limit of the, the ability to appreciate the fact that everybody that is here started not here. Uh, and I think that's an invaluable background that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And in the past, we used to hear that young people suffered an identity crisis growing up. Is, still, is this still the case now? If this no longer is the case, what do you think has changed? Have you experienced one? If so, how did you handle it? Well, I obviously suffered an identity crisis, but um, I think it's actually it's fascinating when I go back to Tennessee, and I think it's more prevalent in the more rural communities, um, because if you grow up in Los Angeles or even somewhere like D.C., Fairfax, where there's a large Korean community,
community, there's more, um, there's like more positive stories and more role models um, and more of an outlet to talk about who you are as a person. Um, but yeah, in, in communities where there you are the Korean person or maybe there's the church um, of, you know, 10, 20 people, I think it's still a struggle and I think um, there's definitely a gap between the second generation um, and then the, the, you know, the, the newer first generation immigrants that are also young and that, that, has not, that bridge has not been built yet. Um, and so I think you know, across the various groups, um, maybe not a crisis, but I think that identity has still yet to be defined and people need to find better modes of, of communicating about it um, outside these large metropolitan areas. And that actually, I, I, I was going to respond to that one as well. So identity crisis, I thought I would add another uh, experience that I had. So my sisters, I'm the oldest of three girls. Uh, we were born here, and as a 10-year-old, I actually had the chance to move back to Korea and live there for a few years. So it was a different Korean-American experience, um, but I think a lot of the emotions as a young girl and now reflecting back, I think we can all relate to. Uh, but I, I distinctly remember my folks sharing, this is going to be so fabulous, you're going to move back, you're going to be with our people, right, our tribe. Um, and I grew up in Ohio, in New York, mostly an East Coast girl, and thought that, okay, this is gonna be great. The name calling is gonna stop. I'm gonna be more accepted. Korean food, nonstop, right? And interestingly enough, my first year, year and a half there, I was enrolled in a Korean school, and my classmates asked me if I was half Caucasian. <laughs> And I had people that would sneak up behind me and pull my hair. And I would ask them, why, why are you pulling my hair? And they said they wanted to touch American hair. <laughs> so reflecting back, it's, uh, you know that, that phrase, perception, sometimes can be reality. Um, so that's something that's definitely influenced sort of my world view, if you will. Um, and I think for girls, I do remember at the Korean school, we, uh, it was during our phys, uh, PE phys ed class, and the boys got to play dodgeball. And up until about eight or nine, I was actually a tomboy. So I said, great, I, I know how to do this. I'm great at dodgeball. But they said the girls could not play dodgeball. Um, so some of those experiences, I think, uh, I just share here because um, I think especially as girls, the notion of playing sports, speaking up, questioning, voicing your perspective, um, we really need to find I don't know if it's a crisis, but I, I, I think there's always room to do more to support our next generation of girls. Um, and then I, I think some folks in the room know that part of my bio, before I went to law school, I intentionally chose to uh, spend some time with the uh, National Mental Health Association, and it was because I was introduced to at-risk youth issues. And believe it or not, within the AAPI community, and also when you look at disaggregated data, and for Korean American girls, and then actually women over 60, we actually suffer from higher depression rates. Um, and for Asian girls in their late teens and early 20s, depression, eating disorders, a lot of this is tied to self-esteem issues. And the thing is, I believe in my heart of hearts. I, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist or a researcher. In my heart of hearts, I know we've got the strength, the resilience within our community to make sure our girls grow up with their sense of self really intact. That's great, thank you. I think that hits home for many of us here. Yeah. So what do you think, um, piggybacking off of that, what do you think are positive passion, Korean, um, positive Korean strength or values? <laughs> so the Korean strength or values and American strength and values. Thank you. Uh, we are very good about taking care of our parents. We have to do it. 
It's not about what you want, it's what we are obliged to do, and I think it's wonderful. If you get into whether or not it's convenient, none of us would ever do it. And it is the single trait that I've always admired about the Asian culture. Uh, and there are so many wonderful things about the American culture uh, that I, I absolutely feel blessed to have been raised here and to be here. We are independent and we are free and we have the ability to do absolutely everything and anything that we want. We believe in the United States we can accomplish truly everything and that is the one thing that all of our parents, whoever came here first, we all know that this is what they said. And it is absolutely true. We are entitled to nothing. But what we did was we came and our parents taught us a work ethic that allowed me to have everything that I have and allowed all of us to be here. Whatever our issues and whatever our concerns, we worked hard for it. My concern is some of that we may be forgetting. It is imperative that we always remember the things that allowed us to succeed in whatever way that we have accomplished anything. And the, the downside of being on the next generation is some of the confusion I think that comes with not understanding quite where we are. I would love my, my niece and nephew do not know how to eat kimchi. It, it bothers me enormously. I said, well, you know, they, they have to eat kimchi. They're Korean. And, uh, and, I, and I also see in them some of the, uh, the things that I see in so many young people today that we don't have uh, a sense of appreciation for why we are who we are in this country and the freedoms that allowed every one of us to succeed as Korean American women, as anyone of any culture or background to succeed. And uh, it, it does worry me at times that we have lost um, some of our ability to accomplish more than maybe people expect because of what our parents taught us. So with that said, the positive values from our Korean heritage as well as our American, how would we bring the best of both worlds into our personal and our professional lives? Work hard, work hard, having that passion. Well, I actually had a, a, a debate with, with a friend about whether it's possible to be Korean American, because he was like, no, you're either Korean or you're American, and you can be American with Korean ethnicity. But um, I actually think um, that the bringing together of those both worlds is what defines the Korean American identity. And um, for me, going back to what we said the strengths and, and values are, um, and Jen and I were talking about this earlier, is uh, for Koreans, I think it's pride and it's passion. Um, and that's reflected um, in our history, in our preferences, uh, in our communication within our families, with the outside world. Um, and in the US, it's, it's about opportunity. And so I think when we combine those things in a productive way, I think that really does highlight the potential of the Korean American community. Could, could I just add, uh, so I, I think this is something that I continue to work on, uh, just to be really frank and candid. So, uh, you know, Priscilla, I, I was taking some notes when you were speaking, so your folks are worried that you're single and you're 30. So when you go home, you can point to me. I'm a little bit older than you and I'm still single. <laughs> And I can cook Korean food if it's an absolute must, but somehow with my professional career, I found excuses to avoid those kinds of circumstances. Um, so how, how do we blend, I think, our cultural heritage, both as, you know, as, a, as a Korean American, and I don't think this is limited to to women, and like I said, I, I'm still reflecting, I'm still synthesizing, um, but intentionally for me, I I'm, I'm, I'm gonna disclose this. We don't need to put this in newsprint or Facebook <laughs> or blogs. So I'm in my 40s, I'm actually closer to 50 than I am 40. Uh, and, uh, 
You know, for me on a personal level, it's been, uh, I've intentionally tried to be more transparent about who I am. And so whether that's in the workplace or whether that's personal, in my personal life. Um, you know, I, I, I still have my Korean friends. And, and they say, come on, Jules, what, you know, let's, let's set you up. When are you going to get married? And I've actually been very candid. I, I didn't think I would be where I'm at now for a lot of different reasons. But I wouldn't change a thing. I love what I'm doing. I feel like there aren't enough hours in the day. Yes, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I don't have the family thing going on. But for me, I think being transparent and honest about it, I'm hopeful will make it a little bit easier for the next Korean American girl or the next Korean American leader, right? I mean, there's enough space in our community to, to accept that, to be accepting and supportive of that. So as I synthesize and reflect, um, you know, I'm going to ask you for your support as I go forward, and then hopefully my, my selfish wish is that in my being selfish, asking my community to support me, that somehow in turn that will support people like, like you, Priscilla, even though I think you're fabulous and you probably don't need the support. Um, but when I was hearing your words, I mean, it won't surprise, I, I've met other girls and young women with similar sentiments. And I'm both inspired and at the same time my heart breaks just a little bit. And so what I, I think what I can do, blending our cultures and as a woman, is, is just to speak some truth to that. Without being offensive to anybody else, but just a sense of transparency, sincerity, and integrity. And, and I think that uh, that's reconciled within our own Korean cultural values and heritage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you did mention that it's important that we receive support as well as us giving support for the future. I think that's a good point. So how have other Korean American leaders helped to open doors for you? How have they supported you? How have they set up a stage for you? How did they push you? Um, I think uh, Mark's sitting right here, and uh, when I was volunteering for this other organization called Kapal, it's a conference on Asian Pacific American leadership, uh, well Mark knows everybody, but uh, he came and spoke, <laughs> he came and spoke multiple times um, to our group when I first moved to D.C., and I just remember thinking, wow, like there's a really articulate Korean American politician out there. Like that's pretty cool. Um, and I, I remember being very inspired by that, and just being um, someone who's willing to talk to little people, like uh, people who are interns, people who are just getting started. Um, that meant a lot to me, and then I think it meant a lot to everyone in the organization that I supported, Marianne. Um, I, I, we have some amazing people in this room, but I just remember the very first time. Marianne is, is, you've always struck me as this like very strong Korean woman, but then she's also, she, she is the most embracing and nurturing and um, encouraging person that I've also met in this community. So I, I think we have um, people who are willing and ready to provide that support. And, and Jen and I were talking about this earlier, and it's really a, a, an imperative on us to reach out and say we would like your help. And it's sometimes hard to do that because we're afraid of rejection or, or being, and sometimes people are like, oh, you're insignificant, so don't talk to me. But you know, most of the time, they'll actually, um, especially in the community, will we'll actually make time to, to have a chat with you and to discuss some of the challenges that um, you face, so. Let me say that I'm not afraid of rejection. <laughs> it's not the pinnacle. I, I have to say, I didn't have many uh, Asian American people as mentors. I was fortunate in my legal community to have mentors within my legal community, and it was very much luck. And I think it's important for all of us, whether or not you have them already, uh, or whether you can forge them, whoever it is, 
You've got to find others who are more experienced than you, who are better connected than you to introduce you to other people in the community and to not forget everyone else. It's not just about us, we are small in number. Uh, I've always been struck by the fact when I am in a gathering like this how many of us there are. It may seem little to others, but to me it's remarkable. Uh, but whoever you can seek out, you've got to make sure that in your particular profession or in your school or whatever your social network is, uh, you've got to be sure to include and talk to as many people as you can. You cannot limit this to Asian Americans. That would make us uh, completely isolated in many ways. You've got to broaden your, your circle of friends as much as you possibly can. Yes, I was actually having a talk uh, with my husband on the way here, and he said, you know, many of us Korean Americans, we go to the functions, Korean American something, Korean American, Asian American, but I think it's really important just to echo what you're saying, is that you got to branch out, you got to go, you got to speak up, as you mentioned when you were speaking upstairs. Yeah, and um, just to go to the next question, if you see a promising young person, how can we help them blossom? How can we help them achieve? Instead of saying, go for it, uh, you can get involved, uh, just go to that networking event, but tangibly, how can we help someone if we see that there is a promising future in that person? I mean, I, I think uh, my fellow colleagues and panelists up here have pretty much summed it up, right? It's uh, just make yourself available, be affirming towards that person. Um, and uh, I, th I think just being transparent and grounded. Um, I know I've had others who've reached out to me. I think some of the most valuable moments have been uh, whether they're Korean American colleagues or the broader network is folks who have to reach out and say, hey, I want to hear how you're doing. Call me, let me know, let's talk about when you've got the successful moments. Probably equally, and I think certain times in our journey, it's also having that mentor reach out and say, you need to make sure you call me, you see me, when you're having a tough time. And if you're scared, or you're anxious, or you're frustrated, or you're mad. Um, and I think the first couple of times, you know, maybe this was a few years ago, uh, you know, you always want to put your best face forward. Mm -hmm. But I think overcoming that, and uh, I do remember, it, it was during some of the Katrina work, I, I reached out to one of my mentors and I said, you know, what's going on with our civil rights laws in this country? And I feel so frustrated. I feel unsuccessful as a lawyer. I feel so obligated to the Asian community in the Gulf Coast. I feel like I'm feeling miserably, and I'm so frustrated, and I'm so upset. Maybe I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Um, and to have that mentor say, your reaction is spot on. Mm -hmm. Be mad. <laughs> be frustrated. And that, that threw me for a loop, but I can't tell you how invaluable that encouragement was and the transparency of that discussion. Um, I would say two things. One is when they are present, uh, whether it's coming to, um, you know, I think a lot of young people when they um, are uh, new to a community and they're trying to find um, their, their footing, uh, they go to a lot of events, um, especially in DC, there's tons of networking events, um, and sometimes they need your support to just be there. Um, and maybe if you are like a really um, uh, prominent person in your community to have, for them to show their peers and other people that you have, they have this network with you can also, I think, mean, take them a long way. Um, and and um, I think the second thing is just to be real with them. I remember one of my mentors told me when I first started a job, they're like, don't be a diva because just because 
because you think you're smart doesn't mean that you can go out and like change the world in, in a day and, and go out and make policy. You have to put in your time. And I think a lot of people when they um, when they're out of school they expect to start off like up here when they're like they don't know anything. So um, you know, just having that very honest advice and, and being present when when you ask them to be there. Okay, we'll move on to the category of career. Uh, in today's workplace, one of your keys to success is your ability to get others to know who you are. We can call it self-promotion. Uh, what you have to offer and how you can make a difference in their organization and your company. How do you do that? How do you let yourself be known? <laughs> it's been a long night, and so let me begin by saying you do it by coming to events like this. It is all about making sure that you are discreet in what you do, but make yourself informed. Ask other people questions, and I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to be here tonight and for bearing with us as we share some of our thoughts with you. I know it's been a long night, so I want to thank all of you. Thank you. So we'll quickly go ahead and move on to the next. How can we incubate our talents, specifically cultivating skills and making contacts? You can more easily propel yourself either to greater success in your next career move. So how can we incubate our talents or, um, you know, really excel in our craft and our skills? Um, this is kind of related to the previous question too, like how, um, what we can do to promote ourselves. Um, I, I'm in this uh, other fellowship program called NetCal, it's a network of Korean American leaders. Um, very cool program for, for people who are interested in applying in other years. But we've been talking a lot about personal brand and, and personal brand being not only um, about what you do, but why you do it. And uh, people remember stories, people remember um, you know, anecdotes of how you got to a certain place um, and, and what motivated you to get there, not necessarily your accomplishments. Um, and so I think that's very important to, when you're thinking of your brand, to, to think about why you're doing what you're doing and why you're passionate about it. Um, and I think that can help incubate more networks that are relevant. Thank you. I know that it's a long night and we were going to leave some room for questions, um, but on the way out, please feel free to discuss or grab one of us and ask questions. And I just want to thank each and every one of you here on the panel table and every one of you sitting here. Everyone is special um, and it means a lot that we have a community like this.